I don't know about you, but if you come into our service of worship and you go through the liturgy and it's time for the sermon, it, it's very easy, although unfortunate, to sort of do it on autopilot. And what I would ask that we might be able to do together is just to take a moment to be still, find a way to relax in the presence of God, and then ask God to make real the things that are being communicated in the scriptures. In, in some ways that's a, the preacher's task, but it's also our task to listen together, and because in the end it's really God who makes it real. Sometimes through the preacher's gifts, sometimes in spite of the lack of the preacher's gifts. Um, and my hope is, is that somehow reality will be communicated uh, either despite or because, or perhaps a mixture of the two, of this time that we share together. So let us pray. Gracious Lord, we do thank you that you promise that when we gather together in the name of your Son, he is here in our midst. So we do pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to his presence. And if you would use these words and that which is spoken in liturgy and scripture and sacrament in such a way as to open our hearts to you. So we do say, speak, Lord, your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. I did that as a way to kind of get us into this because... Quite honestly, I think that what Jesus is doing in the Gospel reading is speak to, speaking to our longings, what we hope might be true of God and of the Christian faith. You see, there's a contrast that John has established in the Gospel. He is just, Jesus has just healed a man. And instead of the fact that there is great rejoicing in the fact that this man, who had been blind and whose sight was restored, it's caused a huge uproar. And what Jesus is doing is contrasting that kind of our obedience to the law is far more important than to people than who he is, which is why he calls himself the good shepherd. That's where this lesson begins where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And he's presenting a contrast. What does the good shepherd do? He lays down his life for the sheep. In other words, the most important thing is the well-being of the sheep. And that actually is preeminently important than anything else. And he contrasts it to higher hands, meaning people who have been paid to come and watch the sheep. But they're really in it for the money. It's, they're only in it for themselves. So that when actual danger happens, when the wolf shows up, who's going to be there to eat and maraud and terrorize the sheep, what does the hireling do? The hireling gets the heck out of town. Because he certainly doesn't want the wolf to attack him. And Jesus says, by contrast, what does the good shepherd do? He actually fights on behalf of the sheep even at the cost, if necessary, of his own life. The good shepherd lays down his life. And so when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, what he's communicating in that word good is not merely someone who is absent of some kind of moral evil as good versus bad. The word actually means admirable, lovely, worthy of our admiration. That's this good shepherd, the one that we deeply know who cares about us. Because who are the sheep in the passage? Well, it's us. Of course, that's not a particularly flattering picture if you know anything about sheep. But it's meant to say something about the dependence that we have and the need that we have for a good shepherd who really is one who stands on our behalf who cares for us, who will, to use contemporary language, go the distance, who will do whatever it takes 
to see that we are kept in the palm of his hand. Why? Because he cares for us and that he knows us intimately and individually. We're not just this sort of blanket of fur, of wool rather, against the hillside. No, he says, I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. In other words, how does Jesus know his Heavenly Father? Well, the answer is perfectly. Perfectly. In all of his fullness, there is no lack. It is in that very same way that the Good Shepherd knows his sheep, those whom he loves, those whom he cares for. So that, look at it this way, that when Jesus looks as it were out on the flock, he doesn't just see this blanket of sheep, he sees Marie, he sees John, he sees Trevor. In other words, he sees people whom he knows. Isn't it true that if you come to the service on a regular basis, you know that one of the ways that we start our service of worship is the call for purity. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires know, and from whom no secrets are hid. That's how we start. And I hope for you that when you hear that calling, it is for you an act of relief. Not, oh gosh, he really knows me. Mm. Should I go hide somewhere? No, instead it's meant to be just the opposite. That I can come into the presence of God and not have any effort at pretense. I can be all of who I am in His presence. And know that what I receive from Him is that I open up the very depths of my heart is mercy, forgiveness, kindness, and deep personal love. All of that is meant when Jesus talks about himself as the good shepherd. And it is because he is this good shepherd, he cares individually and personally. Personally, it's not somehow that God knows humanity as this great mass. That even in the huge tragedies, like for example the earthquake that happened in Nepal, he, he thinks about the names of individuals who have died. We hear a number, and in less than 2,000, I think, is the present count. And that's horrific. But for God, it is much more personal than that. He thinks about names, about families, about relationships, about everything that was going on with every single individual when the earthquake happened. So it is with us that when we gather here this morning, he doesn't see the sort of collection of people here at Emmanuel Church. He looks at each of us individually and knows all that's going on in our heart and in our lives. Now, for me to say all of that about Jesus is an extraordinary assumption because I'm believing that he is, in fact, who he says he is. That he is God in the flesh. If that were not true, all of the things that I would have just said about who he is as the Good Shepherd would have been severely truncated just by the limits of his own humanity. There is no way that if he is just a fine moral teacher or someone who has care and compassion for his twelve, that he would talk both at a very intimate level about his relationship with his heavenly father, the perfection of his knowledge, or the care for all people. That's, that's actually not appropriate language for a human being. We would listen to somebody like that and go, mm. it, it, it's sort of like my wife and I were in the emergency room of Orlando Regional one night, and I was in my collar. And there was a fellow in the room who uh, came up and said he was Jesus Christ. And I just sort of looked at him. And then he got angry because he knew I was a church official and I didn't recognize who he was. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the level at which you have to think about Jesus if you do not believe that he is who he says he is. Logic doesn't give you many other options. It's like the very famous quote by C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity when he says this, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying 
the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus, meaning, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God in the flesh. Lewis says, that's the one thing that we must not say. A man who is merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not actually be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of the man who claims that he is a pooch egg, or he would be the devil. You must make a choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. Let us not come with any patronizing nonsense of his merely being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. That is the assumption that rolls through this entire passage. Jesus is not just presenting himself in contrast to the hired hands who rejected the miracle of the man born blind and mistreated the man because he was the object of the miracle. He is actually presenting himself in a very clear way as to who he is as the one who is known perfectly by his Heavenly Father and knows and cares for all people everywhere. That's a God characteristic. Which is why even this morning when we go through the creed together, we make the outrageous claims that we do about who Jesus is. If, if we do not say that we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, then somehow the logic of what's being laid out in this passage absolutely begins to fall apart. We begin to find holes in it. You see, do not think about Jesus as the good shepherd merely as an act of sentiment. Oh, that's nice. It's this idyllic picture of Jesus up on a hillside holding a sheep, typically around his neck, like this, and going, that's not it. There is a deep tenderness to Jesus as the Good Shepherd. But remember, this is the Good Shepherd who is choosing to lay down his life to die on behalf of the sheep. And he predicts and prefigures his own crucifixion and resurrection when he says, I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, meaning I have power over all human authority. I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up again. Those are claims a mere mortal could not make. And so Jesus, in the very tenderest of expressions of who he is as the admirable, lovely, good shepherd, is actually opening a window and inviting him to see, in fact, not just a redefinition of religious authority, a shepherd who, in fact, cares for his sheep, but he is presenting who he is as the Son of God, who in fact always will be for each one that very, very good shepherd. God in the flesh, who knows each one of us by name. In the, in the service, we're going to have people who are standing for confirmation. That means they're committing, they say, I believe the tenets of Christianity are true. I believe that Jesus is who he says he is, and I'm willing to serve him, and I am making a public commitment to do so. You who enter into the liturgy who will be asked to reaffirm the commitments that you have made in baptism and perhaps confirmation. Also stand with them in those commitments and those promises. This entire service rings with the joyous announcement that Jesus, risen from the dead, is in fact Lord over all, and not any kind of tyrant or ogre, but a tender shepherd who in his divine authority chooses to express that in tender individual and personal love, and it is out of that love and the mercy of his forgiveness that he has captured our hearts and that we know him as one who loves us, forgives us, brings mercy, 
purpose and power to us that we might live with that kind of winsomeness, that kind of poise, that kind of grace, and that kind of authority because we know we are literally surrounded and shielded by one who conquered death, the good shepherd who has laid down his life for the sheep. That's the kind of authority that you saw in the Acts reading, where in the midst of, in this case, another miracle, they're coming after them. And yet they speak with wisdom, and they speak with grace, and they speak with a tremendous kind of confidence because of what they know and believe to be true. It is only in that kind of love that we can even begin to love one another, which is the call in the first John reading. Because he, in fact, loved us. Because we owe him all of who we are. And because he loves us without measure. Then, of course, God help us that we might love each other. But if we do not understand that the love that Jesus is asking of us is based on what Jesus did in his love for us, inevitably our love will be limited. And it will be limited to courtesy. Generosity that is convenient for us. It will not be ground in sacrifice. Because you see, I, I have to take care of myself, you know. Jesus was the one who gave himself with abandon for you, for me. And it is out of that that he pours into us that capacity to give and be generous. So this morning, I would invite you first and foremost to see him for who he says he is. Jesus, the good shepherd, God in the flesh, who knows each one of us by name, who calls us in resurrected life to come and to serve him and to follow him. Because that's what it means to be one of his sheep. And for us, to say yes is an invitation to joy. Let us pray together. Gracious Lord, we do thank you that you do know each one of us by name and that nothing is hidden from you and that you have poured upon us such forgiveness and mercy and kindness that even in our rebellion, you bring us to yourself and you call us your own. Lord, we do not deserve it, but we thank you so much for pouring it out upon us. Thank you that today you are our good shepherd and that we can know you and love you. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, 